here now Vivek Ramaswamy, Strive co-founder and executive chairman and Nation of Victims author. Uh, Vivek, great to see you tonight. Let's start where Kelly left off there. Um, with respect to this Google story, it seems like a little bit more work needs to be done to understand exactly what's happening here. But if the suspicion were correct and Google, another tech giant, using its influence um, to suppress the GOP and, and Republican candidates, that could be considered election interference. So could uh, suppressing the Hunter Biden story uh, right ahead of the election on social media. So could President Biden asking the Saudis, hey, don't cut production until after the midterms. I mean, we're starting to see evidence here um, that this is uh, a theme, if, if you will. So let's talk about the Google case in particular. We hear a lot about the threats to our democracy. Well, guess what? I think this is a big threat to our democracy. To give one corporatocratic, autocratic actor the chance to tilt the scales of what the public can and cannot see about the candidates that they're asked to vote for in November, that is a threat to democracy. And this should not be a liberal or a conservative issue. If yeah. they can do it to conservatives today, they could do it to liberals tomorrow. And I think that both liberals and conservatives can be too short-sighted in seeing this as a partisan issue. Yeah. Now, I oh, personally sorry. think that there are grounds to even look at this as a campaign finance violation. If you quantify the amount of value given to a candidate as an in-kind contribution for manipulating search results, I think that's an interesting legal direction to go here as well. Oh, it absolutely is. Um, and it's funny because it's the left-wing commentators, it's Hillary Clinton, who are talking about um, the midterms and also 2024 and saying it's the Republicans planning to try to steal an election, yet nobody is addressing um, these claims that, that we just talked about. So uh, in the coming days, I imagine it'll be part of the conversation, at least on this network, um, because we report those kinds of things. But I want to switch gears while I have you um, and use your expertise on Elon Musk and Twitter, where we're going from there. Um, Elon Musk reportedly pledging to close the $44 billion deal by Friday. He even visited uh, the Twitter headquarters today, and he tweeted out a video that I have to tell you really was hysterical. We have it there. He, he carried the kitchen sink into Twitter. He said, let this sink in. So look, I would love to see this deal close. I think that Twitter is going to be a better company. I think America is going to be a better country if it is owned by somebody who wants to operate this as a free speech platform. I think the drama of the last few months has been a little bit unfortunate to be able to go through the drama of actually getting here. But at the end of the day, Elon Musk may have felt that he overpaid, did try to get his way out of the deal. But at the end of the day, if he said it was his vision to operate this as a free speech platform right. and that it wasn't about the money, I think that's actually going to be a positive development. And, and I think that there's a way to do it. I mean, the core dilemma the day he takes over is going to be how do you cleanse the site of a lot of the content that's constitutionally protected that, but that most people don't want to see, mm. while at the same time preventing political discrimination. I think there's a clear answer to that. It is to give choice back to the users. If the users want the old censorship filters, they can opt into them. But if they don't, give people that power back. I hope that's what he does. Well, it's a great point, and there's a lot of speculation that he's going to, you know, clean house when he gets there internally in the company as well. That's part of the problem. The Twitter workers composing an open letter to Musk protesting his plan to fire nearly 75 percent of the workforce there. Um, but, you know, he's got a valid point, right? What exactly was going wrong at the company? Why was it going in the wrong direction? Some of it is leadership, yes. but. Some of it is the subordinates carrying out certain actions as well. Look, I also think the company is going to have a lot of debt, so it's going to have to be financially disciplined. I think Silicon Valley and a lot of the workers in Silicon Valley have inherited this culture of entitlement. Yes, tech stocks have done well over the course of the last decade, aided by loose monetary policy from the Federal Reserve. Now, as times get tougher, that culture of entitlement still continues. Entitlement breeds laziness. And as I often say, victimhood fits laziness like a glove. <laughs> I think that at the end of the day, this is going to be a wake up call to those employees that they don't have a right to work or even more precisely in Silicon Valley, a right not to work and stay home and pretend to work. That's not a right. Ultimately, companies need to be run for the benefit of advancing their mission. I'm sorry that Twitter's employees are going to have to learn that lesson. No, it's a great point, And you're teasing ahead to my next segment. Great to see you, Vivek. Thank you so much.